we are discussing the variational method and uh, we have presented an introduction to it. We have said that what we do is we write a functional epsilon 0 which has more or less the same form of as the uh, ground state energy. The only difference is that the ground expression for ground state energy would involve the actual wave functions that we do not know and for epsilon 0 we have some trial guess wave function that we have given. And then we said that this wave function would have some associated uh, parameters which are called variational parameters. What we do is we would vary these parameters, change the values of these parameters, calculate epsilon 0 and upper limit theorem tells us that whatever minimum value we get for epsilon 0 is the maximum possible value for E0 or the upper bound or upper limit of E0. So, let us uh, demonstrate this by going back to our old friend the hydrogen atom right. Uh, of course, we do not have to do this variation treatment for hydrogen atom because we already know the solutions. But since we know the solutions this hydrogen atom provides a very good test system because we know the expression for energy. We know that this Hamiltonian is like this okay, and it is ground state right. So, since it is ground state uh, I am only bothered with the R part of the Hamiltonian. I do not bother about the theta and phi Hamiltonian because I know that in the ground state wave function uh, there is uh, no theta phi dependence. Also I know the ground state energy. This is something that well I am not sure if I have written exactly it in, in this form earlier, but it is the same as what we have written earlier. Okay? I know the energy. Now uh, the good thing is I should be able to uh, use variation method and get something that is close. Okay? We have not uh, really derived the theorem yet, we will do that. But right now we are taking it axiomatically for the next 15 minutes or so and we are working it out. And when I say we are working it out, I am lying because I will not work out anything. I hope you remember our rule, you have to sit in front of the computer with a pen and paper, you are going to work out. Okay? I am not, I'm not going to do uh, so much of integration and all because then it will take a lot of time and it is quite mundane, you can do it. So, we will try to see whether we get a similar expression first of all and we will try to see whether the uh, minimum value of epsilon 0 that I get is uh, more than E0. Okay? If, if it is so, how much more? Let us proceed. So, let us say I take a trial or guess wave function phi equal to e to the power minus alpha r square. So, alpha is the variational parameter. Okay? I am not using this q as variational parameter just as yet. Let us see what happens if I just vary alpha. If it is not good then of course, I want to try with 3, 4 and so on and so forth in the exponent. But we will see what happens. And why am I choosing this e to the power minus alpha r square all of a sudden? Uh, two reasons. First of all, uh, this is a uh, well behaved wave function is not it because it goes to 0 at r equal to infinity, it is a Gaussian function. Secondly, uh, I am cheating a little bit because I already know the solution, I know what the 1s wave function is right that is e to the power minus k r sort of okay? it is an exponential decay. So, Gaussian decay and exponential decay how different are they? Okay? Um, what I am saying is An exponential decay is something like this. Ah, I goofed, sorry. Not bad. This is a, let us say an exponential decay, something like e to the power minus kr. And what is a Gaussian decay? It is something like this. So, I might as well play around with this parameter alpha and try to see whether I can bring this Gaussian down here okay, as close to this exponential decay as possible. There will always be some mismatch in near r equal to 0 okay, and I will normalize and get it as close as possible. It will never be exactly the same, but uh, it is 
not very different. I mean if we close one eye and uh, shut the other a little bit, we will uh, we can live with this okay? and we will see whether we can really live with this or not. Okay? So, phi equal to e to the power minus alpha r square. So, alpha here is the variational parameter that we have discussed already. Great. So, now this is the expression for epsilon 0, okay? we know this. So, what I will do is I uh, will just write down but not solve, I will only give you the final solution, you solve if you want and you should solve and convince yourself that this is correct. Uh, this treatment is from uh, Macquarie's quantum chemistry book, not Macquarie and Simon physical chemistry, huh? uh, Macquarie only Macquarie quantum chemistry. So, I just plug in the expression for Hamiltonian and I write the uh, value, I write the expression for the trial wave function and uh, all I have to do is just see what I get and this is what I get, I am giving you the answer. Please work it out yourself, you will have to use a standard integral as usual. Okay, this is what I get. What is the denominator? Denominator is simpler, right? e to the power minus alpha r square. So, multiplied by e to the power minus alpha r square, what is it? And then integrate from 0 to infinity, this is what you get. So, when you divide the numerator by the denominator, you get the value with the expression for epsilon 0 function of phi as 3 h cross square alpha by 2 mu minus e square alpha to the power half divided by root over 2 epsilon 0 pi to the power 3 by 2. Fantastic. What is the next step? What am I looking for? I am looking for what is the value of minimum value of epsilon 0. Okay. How do I change the value of epsilon 0? The only thing that I can play around with here is alpha variational parameter. So, I keep on changing the value of alpha okay, and I have to look for the minimum. So, essentially I have to again well even though we have said it earlier I will draw that curve once again. Let us say this is the value of epsilon 0 with respect to alpha and to keep things simple I will just show one minimum. Let us say this here is the plot. I seek to find the value of epsilon 0 at this value of alpha. So, to do that I have to first find this value of alpha where epsilon 0 is minimum. Now, let us think of what we have learnt in high school calculus. I have a plot. How do I find the minimum of a plot or the maximum of a plot for that matter? Differentiate and equate it to 0, right? For maximum as well as minimum, the slope here is something like this, the slope here is 0, is not it? So, uh, what we have to do is we have to know what happens. We have to find the uh, minimum value of epsilon 0. To do that, we simply differentiate epsilon 0 with respect to alpha and equate it to 0. Right? First derivative has to be 0, that is all. How do you differentiate between a minimum and a maximum, by the way? Yeah? For minimum as well as maximum, this is uh, the first derivative is equal to 0. What about the second derivative? Second derivative is it? 0 or positive or negative for maximum and minimum. I leave it to you to refresh your memory on that. Here at least in the curve that I have shown I do not have to worry because I have not even shown a maximum only a minimum point is there. Okay. So, differentiate this and equate it to 0. What will you get? You will get a value of alpha is not it? That value of alpha turns out to be mu square e to the power 4 by 18 pi cube epsilon 0 square h cross to the power 4. I have given you the answer. You should not be satisfied with that. You should differentiate it, equate to 0, see what value of alpha you get and convince that whatever we get, your, uh, convince yourself that what we have written here is indeed correct. Please do it. Okay. So, we plug in this value of alpha here in the second term and in the first term, what will happen? I will get some expression for epsilon 0, which is a function of phi. And that expression turns out to be minus 4 by 3 pi 
mu e to the power 4 by 16 pi square epsilon 0 square h cross square and I am calling this e min perhaps I should have called it epsilon min but then I am using a different convention than Macquarie I wanted to get back and be at par with him. So, I have written e min which is what is written in Macquarie's book e min turns out to be minus 4 by 3 by pi e to the power 4 by 16 pi square epsilon 0 square h cross square that turns out to be equal to minus 0 0.424 mu e to the power 4 16 pi square epsilon 0 square h cross square. Yeah, I just clean it up a little bit for you. So, this is what we have get minus, point, uh, zero, minus 0 0.424 multiplied by this factor and this is what we have got from the exact solution minus 0 0.500 multiplied by the same factor. So, is that good or is that good? It is good. First thing we see is that this is a demonstration of the upper limit theorem. E min is greater than E0, it is close. Since it is close I say the agreement is good, but it is still greater than E0, it is not less than E0. That is point number 1. This is not a proof by the way, it is an illustration. Now we can think that okay, we have got 0 0.424 and uh, here it is 0 0.500. How can I get closer to 0 0.500? And the answer would be by playing introducing some other parameter. I have taken uh, a Gaussian parameter. So instead of 2, I can write q and I can play around with q. And you know what will happen? If q goes closer to 1, and I am saying this because I know what way 1s wave function is. If q goes closer to 1, then the match should be better. So, the energy that I get should be closer to the energy that I get from the exact solution. Besides, I could multiply this by a number maybe so that you get the correct function, but that may not make any difference. So, I can play around with the exponent here. So, if you put in more parameters, I get a closer match. Well, uh, when you do this kind of what I should say curve fitting, if you use more parameters you always get a better match and sometimes there is this danger which is called over parameterization. Here we do not have to worry about over parameterization that is great because remember, remember that cartoon uh, on the cover page of the previous module, we cannot do better than the best. Whatever we get is always more than the actual value of energy. So, even if you over parameterize it is not a problem, it is a beautiful consequence of the upper limit theorem. Okay. So, I can actually increase the number of parameters, I can have trivial parameters eventually, but does not matter. So, if you can, if you have the time and you have the capability, you can just keep on increasing the parameter, number of parameters. So, what we have to do is we have to optimize this epsilon 0 functional that is related to energy with respect to each and every parameter. So, you need to do iterations. And you can understand that uh, here we are looking at a very simple system, we are working with only one parameter. For larger systems there will be many, many parameters. So, if I try to do it by hand, it will take me so much of time that by the time I am done, uh, the problem may not be relevant anymore. So, you have to use computers. So, requirement of this excessive large number of calculation requires an interfacing of chemistry with computers. Conventionally when you see think chemistry, when you talk about chemistry you think of color, smell, many times bad smell, beaker, conical flask, weighing balance. Yeah? But now we see that computers turn, seem to have an important role to play in chemistry because you cannot do these computers any longer without, sorry you cannot do these calculations any longer without using good computers. So, this iterative method is sort of our introduction to the requirement of computational chemistry. Of course, we are nowhere close to the actual thing yet, I mean in this course, right. Computational chemistry nowadays has developed into a huge field, uh, we will not get into computational chemistry, but we are taking baby steps towards it. What I am saying is that this is the first baby step, our introduction to iterative method is our first baby step towards this vast field of computational quantum chemistry. 
And in doing so, one thing that might happen is that we might lose sight of exact solutions. Is that good or is that bad? See here we use some arbitrary function no? e to the power minus alpha r square Gaussian function, not a really the exact solution, yeah, but still we got it. And then we said that we will introduce more parameters. So, we will deviate further and further and further from the exact solution. Is that good or is that bad? But it is good in the sense that uh, sometimes we no, do not may not even know the exact solution. That is the reason why you want to do variational method rather than perturbation theory. Right? So, if you can forget about the exact function that is great, yeah? just change the number of parameters do not bother about the wave function bother about the energy that is a good part of it. The bad part of it is that we might lose a little bit of physical insight. So, you see all these orbitals that we talked about uh, after some time these orbitals may not be necessary anymore. We can just construct the uh, wave function here I have used one Gaussian function. I can take a linear combination of many Gaussian functions, right? I can take exponential functions, I can take introduce some asymmetry factor. So, this way I can actually synthesize the wave function by using mathematical functions, simpler mathematical functions, which is great because I can uh, with enough computational power I can find the energy. And uh, from the point of view of a conventional physical chemist you might be a little sad because you will not be able to perhaps after a while uh, say uh, much that is in relation to your good old 1 s 2 s 2 b orbitals or maybe you can we will see. Okay. Now that we have illustrated that this upper limit theorem works for hydrogen atom let us move forward to a formal proof of the theorem. And let us say once again that uh, we can write this kind of Schrodinger equation for this arbitrary system and let us say psi i's are constitute the complete orthonormal unknown com complete orthonormal set of unknown wave functions. Let us say there are n such wave functions. Okay. Here again I deviate a little bit from Macquarie's uh, treatment Macquarie has written n I am writing i okay. because I thought that you use n for a particular uh, value and then use n as an index you might get confused. So, I am using i which is an index. All right. So, now let us define an arbitrary wave function that we will work with. Remember phi we define phi and this time I say that I can write phi as a sum of c i psi i. Is this valid? Actually it is because See what are psi i's? We are taking an orthonormal set, right? A complete orthonormal set. So they are like the coordinates of that function space. I take some arbitrary function in that function space. I want to work in that function space because the system is same. I should be able to uh, express it in terms of the coordinates of that space, the, norm, the modes of that space, space right? That's why it is perfectly valid to write phi equal to sum over i c i psi i. Okay. I construct the arbitrary wave functions that way and uh, as we have discussed earlier we define epsilon 0 uh, to be uh, integral phi star h phi divided by integral phi star phi over the entire function space. Okay. So far so good I hope you can proceed yeah let us go proceed. So, what I will do now is I am going to write it out and I have written it out completely I should have animated a little, little bit more please do not get scared I will go term by term. Uh, well I should have ideally written a summation but I myself get confused sometimes if there are too many summation signs. So, I have actually opened the summation. So, this is what will happen phi is what phi is this summation right. So, I have just opened it up c1 psi 1 plus c2 psi 2 plus c3 psi 3 so on and so forth until c n psi n. Okay. So, the general term here c i psi i I sum over i. Right. So, actually I am work with its complex conjugate remember of a function or function in the bra vector is actually its uh, complex conjugate. Left this left multiplies h operating on phi which is h operating on c 1 psi 1 plus c 2 psi 2 same thing. In the denominator we have integral 
C1 psi 1 plus C2 psi 2 etcetera etcetera complex conjugate multiplied by C1 psi 1 plus C2 psi 2 etcetera etcetera okay, integrated over all space. Now what will I do now? I will remember that H psi i is equal to E i psi i. Okay. So, what happens when H operates on this? Let me write. So, uh, what this means essentially is say H psi 1 is equal to E 1 psi 1 why have I put the arrow there this. So, what is H operating on C 1 psi 1 that will be equal to C 1 into E 1 psi 1 remember we are working with uh, linear operators, but I have written it so horribly I think I will erase it and I will write the whole thing once again. What I am saying is this Schrodinger equation is something like this H operates on psi 1 to give me E 1 psi 1. So, what happens when H operates on C 1 psi 1 that is the same as C 1 multiplied by H psi 1 is not it linear operator. So, this will be simply C 1 E 1 psi 1. Similarly, H operating on C 2 psi 2 will be C 2 E 2 psi 2 so on and so forth. Okay. So, essentially this ket vector will become uh, sum over I C i E i psi i. Perhaps you understand I perhaps I do not need to explain in such meticulous detail, but I still will in case uh, somebody does. So, this is what it is I have not worked with the denominator yet I hope I have not made any mistake anywhere yeah. So, this is what I get in the bra vector I have C 1 psi 1 plus C 2 psi 2 etcetera etcetera sum over i C i psi i this in the k vector I now have sum over i C i E i psi i. Okay. Now, let us remember that these psi's are all orthonormal. So, what happens when I try to uh, simplify this numerator or denominator a little further? First, let me take this term C i psi i and this. So, I may well write this C i psi i and C i e 1 psi i. So, this will give me integral C i in ket vector sorry C 1 in ket vector C 1 psi 1 in bra vector yeah is there anything else well let us not forget that I have psi 1 here as well. I can take these uh, coefficients out of the integral they are constant. So, that becomes C 1 star C 1 right this this is actually C 1 in bra vector remember it is actually C 1 star. So, C 1 star C 1 comes out and inside the integral you are left with integral psi 1 star psi 1 d tau what is that that is equal to 1 because they are normalized. Similarly, if I take this term and this term what will I get? I will get C 1 star C 2 integral psi 1 star psi 2 d tau, but then orthonormal right orthonormal right. So, uh, these are all orthogonal to each other. So, this integral must be equal to 0. So, I am only left with C 1 star multiplied by integral psi 1 star psi 1 d tau. Similarly, I will get uh, sorry C 1 star C 1 multiplied by integral psi 1 star psi 1 d tau. 
Similarly, I will get C2 star C2 integral psi 2 star uh, psi 2 d tau. So, the general term here will be C i star C i integral psi i star psi i d tau. So, i j kind of term will not be there and it will be a summation over i. What will the denominator be? Similarly, denominator also has to become sum over i c i star c i right because take these two terms again maybe I will take these two c 2 psi 2 and c 2 psi 2 here that gives you c 2 star c 2 integral psi 2 star psi 2 all space and if I take say c 3 psi 3 and well c n psi n then I get c 3 star c n integral psi 3 star psi n over all function space which is equal to 0. Right. So, this is what I get. Um, did I goof up a little bit in the numerator? Actually, I did. See here, what I have written is I have forgotten something. I have forgotten that I have uh, E1 also, Ei. So, uh, numerator turns out to be C1 star C1 E1 right because the integral uh, of psi i star psi i over all function space is 0 plus C2 star C2 E2 so on and so forth. Denominator is C1 star C1 plus C2 star C2 plus C3 star C3 so on and so forth. Okay. So, I will write it as summations that I have written here and I made a mistake while writing the numerator. So, this is sum over i C i star C i E i divided by sum over i C i star C i. Okay. Now, what do I actually want? I am trying to prove the variation theorem, upper limit theorem. So, what I want to know is whether this epsilon 0 minus E 0 is greater than or equal to 0 or not. So, let me subtract E 0 from left hand side then I have to subtract it from right hand side also. So, this is what I get yeah and uh, these steps are simple. So, I will just rush through. Uh, so, this is basically one summation minus another summation all right. So, I can just make it one summation and bo in both the cases coefficient of E i is C i star C i. So, I can write like this E i and E 0 both coefficient is C i star C i. So, I get this numerator is sum over C i star C i multiplied by E i minus E 0 divided by C i star C i. Now, please remember what is E 0? E 0 is our definition of ground state energy. What is E i? E i is the energy of some excited state, okay? some excited state for i is non equal, not equal to 0. So, will you agree with me that uh, E i minus E 0 has to be positive or at most 0 when i equal to 0? Yeah, Because energy of the ground state is the lowest right. For all, all values of i other than 0 energies are higher and higher that is why it is called ground state. If ground state cannot be above the excited state well in case of some human beings it is but uh, they are not quantum mechanical systems fine. So, E i minus E 0 has to be greater than or equal to 0 because E0 is the lowest value of energy among all the EIs that are possible. Remember I is the general index. Okay. In fact, I should have perhaps written 0 here also. If I define I to be 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth, I am not writing 0. Well, whatever. Well, the 0 means ground state. That is point number 1. Point number 2 is uh, what is CI star CI? Some complex number multiplied by its complex conjugate yields a real number. Can it ever be negative? Never. Complex conjugates are defined in such a way that when they multiply each other you are going to get a positive real number is not it? Yeah? Uh, if there is any confusion please go back to some basic book of complex numbers 11, 12 level book your doubt will be cleared. Otherwise just believe me when I say that C i star C i has to be a positive real number. So, this is also 0. So, in the denominator I have something that is 
uh, positive. In the numerator E i minus E 0 is positive and I just said that C i star C i is also positive. So, this epsilon 0 minus E 0 is a positive quantity divided by a positive quantity which is a positive quantity. Hence, we have been able to prove the variation theorem or upper limit theorem which says that epsilon 0 minus E 0 is greater than or equal to 0 or in other words the uh, functional epsilon that we calculate by varying the parameters of phi can never be less than the actual energy and that is a saving grace ok. That is why variation theorem is so useful. So, uh, that is what we have learned today. We have done it from quantum chemistry's uh, book by Donald McQuarrie. We are going to use Pillar's book also in this context. What we will do next is that now that we have proved this theorem, we are going to see how uh, we can get an expression for ground state of harmonic oscillator, how we can get an expression for the energy levels of particle in a box using variation method and uh, somewhere in the line maybe before this or after this we will show that uh, for trial functions that depend linearly on variational parameter we get a secular determinant and the moment we get a secular determinant uh, the solution becomes very simple right and that becomes a cornerstone in trying to solve variational problems. And then finally, we are going to use the variation method and also perturbation method in multi electron atom right. So, all this is coming up in the next few modules as I say in FM channels stay tuned. <laughs>